mileage when I use my car. I mean, gas ain't cheap, you know. <laughs> we think that 25 cents a mile is pretty generous. How about 27? And uh, when I make long-distance calls, will they be monitored or is it on the honor system? It's Sunday morning on CBS, and here again is Charles Osgood. That's no ordinary job applicant. That's Warren Buffett playing the part of one haggling over the terms of employment in the TV sitcom The Office. In real life, of course, Warren Buffett is very much his own man, as Rebecca Jarvis shows us in this Sunday profile. Nice wheels. Yeah. <laughs> well. So uh, how old is this caddy? I think it's about five years or so. You'd think the third richest man in the world might have his own chauffeur, but not Warren Buffett. He prefers being in the driver's seat. Do any of your billionaire friends ever joke with you about the Cadillac and that you're driving and not a something flashier? Uh, no, they really, they know me pretty well. On a cold winter morning, Buffett chauffeured me around his hometown of Omaha, Nebraska, pointing out all the hot spots. This is the McDonald's I go to frequently. So what do you have at McDonald's? Probably three times out of four, I get a sausage and McMuffin. And, but then at lunchtime, I get a quarter pounder and fries. A modest meal for a man worth some $46 billion. His humble tastes have humble origins. Yeah, well, that is true. It was a Sears Roebuck house. And in those days, they called it Sears Roebuck, not Sears. Buffett took us to his childhood home. My dad bought it in 1925. He bought it about two weeks before he was going to get married. He paid $55 a month on his mortgage. 55 a month. A month. Uh, on the mortgage. Buffett since moved, but says his new home is no palace either. I could buy any house in the world, and, and, and I don't want any other house than the one I'm in. You know, and that house is in a middle class neighborhood. I'm happy in a pair of khakis and a sweater, so I, I, don't, I, I don't need fancy clothes. I don't need fancy food. Do you have an iPad? I do not have an iPad. iPhone? No. Yeah, I, 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 he prefers books. Yeah and reads avidly. Even as a boy, Buffett, whose father started a small stock brokerage, devoured anything he could find on money. I bought my first stock when I was 11. <laughs> Which is incredible, that at 11 years old, you were buying your first stock. Well, I would have bought it sooner, but I didn't have the money. <laughs> I, it, took me, it took me about five years to save $120. That was in 1941. Oh, there I am down at the bottom here. There you are in the, I'm, this I'm corner. i here, and that's Bob Russell and Rich You kind of have like a little bit of a grin on your face. I must, like... have, must have been thinking about uh, investments at the time. <laughs> <laughs> Warren Buffett, now 82, has vowed to give his money away to charity. So this is you. Well, this is me and my classmates. It's a fortune he's been building since his days here at Rose Hill Elementary School. When you were sitting here at Rose Hill Elementary, did you think at that point, I want to be the richest man in the world someday? Uh, no, but I thought I wanted to be rich. <laughs> <laughs> what appealed to you about being rich? Well, I like to be independent. I, I want to be able to do what I want to do every day, and, uh, and, and money lets you do that. Fortune magazine writer Carol Loomis is a close friend. She's been covering Buffett's career for 46 years. Tap Dancing to Work is a collection of her articles about him. What would you say is his biggest strength? Well, his biggest strength, without doubt, is his rationality that he brings to business and investing. And uh, this is a trait, rationality, that you would think many investors uh, would bring to their work. But the fact is, uh, most of them are swept up by emotions most of the time at some crucial time. And he never does that. If you had invested $1,000 in Buffett's company in, say, April of 1966, your holdings today would be worth $6.5 million. What role has luck played in your success? Well, there's, there's, luck enters into everybody's life. And Buffett says that begins at birth. The womb from which you emerge uh, uh, determines uh, your fate to an enormous degree for most of the seven billion people in the world. Just in my own case, I was born in 1930. I had two sisters that have every bit the intelligence I have, every bit the drive, but they didn't have the same opportunities. Because you were a man. I, and I was white. Uh, so if I'd been black, my future would have been entirely different. If I'd been a female, my life would have been entirely different. Buffett is just as outspoken about economic inequality. In a 2011 New York Times editorial, he wrote, 
while the poor and middle class fight for us in Afghanistan, and while most Americans struggle to make ends meet, we mega-rich continue to get our extraordinary tax breaks. I would say that in a country with $50,000 of GDP per person, that nobody should be hungry, nobody should lack a good education, nobody should be worried about medical care, you know, nobody should be worried about their old age. And that doesn't mean looking for an equality of results. I mean, you want great inequality of results. You want the Steve Jobses to be working in those garages or the Dave Packards or Bill Gates or you name it. But you do not want anybody going to bed hungry or, or, or uh, having uh, uh, medical care denied to them or just the basics of life. What about our debt? $16.4 trillion. It's a lower percentage that is a percentage of GDP than it was when we came out of World War II. You've got to think of it in relation to GDP. It is not a good thing to have it going up in, in relation to GDP. That should be, that should be stabilized. And, but the debt itself is not a problem. So what's the biggest problem facing President Obama in his second term? <laughs> I would say Congress. <laughs> uh, but you know, we look at Washington and you get discouraged, but I will tell you what, what is right about America just totally dwarfs what's wrong about Washington. 535 people are not going to mess up 315 million over time. You believe that? Oh, I know it, yeah. <laughs> to see the future, Buffett says all we need to do is remember our past. If you really want to know the wonder of America, look about you and then, you know, take it back in time 200 years and it wasn't there. So what's happened? We've had a system that's released the, the potential of human beings. But we will have hiccups along the way. And we had a big hiccup when the, when the housing bubble burst in 2008. But the Dow Jones average in the 20th century went from 66 to 11,497. We went through the Great Depression, world wars, all kinds of things. And this country just keeps chugging forward. It's hard to walk away from Warren Buffett without feeling optimistic. It's even harder to sit across from him without wondering. Do you have any stock tips for me? <laughs> <laughs> well, just between you and <laughs> Yes. It'll be our little secret. Yeah. But it's no secret that Buffett puts his money in stocks. The average person will not know enough to know which stocks to buy. They won't know enough to know when to buy them, but they don't have to because if they can buy all of America through an index fund. And then they just have to be sure they don't jump in at exactly the wrong time. And they won't know what's exactly the wrong time. So therefore, they should put their money in over a period of time. And they'll have some periods that are wonderful and some that weren't so good. But overall, they will do fine over time. Warren Buffett has done better than fine. In fact, he's done well enough to have no regrets. It would be churlish for anybody with all the good luck I've had in life. And I, I, to look back and say, you know, that this could have been better, that could have been better. It's been wonderful. Do you look back? Not much. I think it's a big mistake to look back. Next.